Hi everyone, this is the video for Act 2, Scene 4 of Romeo and Juliet. In this scene, Benvolio and Mikusho discuss Tybalt's challenge, the fact that obviously Tybalt at the party had sworn revenge on the uh, Montagues, and um, Romeo then joins them. And they're kind of challenging Romeo about the fact that he disappeared the night previously. They're making jokes about perhaps where he might have been um, before the nurse then arrives to find Romeo and um, pass on a message from uh, Juliet. Um, we're actually going to break this scene into two um, separate sections. There'll be a short section in the middle which we'll kind of skip over. Don't worry about that. That no would be normally what we would do in class. Um, because in the exam there'll be an extract that is selected, they're normally very rich extracts taken from particular key points in the overall plot. So um, it's not unusual for us to sometimes say, right, we're going to skip over this part um, simply because the, the language doesn't add a huge amount to the type of analysis that we're doing um, on Romeo and Juliet and the depth in which we need it. So we'll start with just, again, same, same uh, way as previously, a little bit of reading and then we'll um, draw our attention to some particular quotations that um, I've selected as being important as those kind of gold quotations that we're going to use a lot. So we're on a street in Verona, enter Benvolio and Mercutio. Where the devil should this Romeo be? Came he not home tonight? Not to his father's, I spoke with his man. Why, that same pale-hard-hearted wench, that Rosaline, torments him so that he will, sh he will sure run mad. Tybalt, the kinsman to old Capula, hath sent a letter to his father's house. A challenge on my life. Romeo will answer it. Any man that can write may answer a letter. Nay, he will answer the, less, the letter's master, how he dares being dared. Alas, poor Romeo, he is already dead, stabbed with a white wench's black eye, run through the ear with a love song. Now this is the quotation that I think is interesting here. Mikusho is talking about Romeo and about this kind of love sickness that Romeo has. And he says, he is already dead, run through the ear with a love song. That's the part there that we need to highlight. This metaphor reminds us of the pain that love inflicts and that life is almost worthless without love. Without Rosaline's love, the two men think, essentially Romeo is already dead. He's already been run through the ear, stabbed and killed um, with a love song and, and a promise of love that's not been answered according to them. Benvolio says, why? What is Tybalt? More than a prince of cats. Oh, he is the courageous captain of compliments. He fights as you sing prick song, keeps time, distance and proportion. He rests his minim rests, one, two and the third in your bosom. The very butcher of a silk button. A duelist, a duelist, a gentleman of the first house, of the first and second. The first and second cause. Ah, the immortal Pisado, the punto reverso, the hay. So here we have this language used to describe Tybalt. Now, importantly, throughout the text, um, Tybalt is often called the Prince of Cats. Now, that's obviously because of, directly because of comparison to, uh, to a cat in the sense of his character. His character is predatory, it's territorial. Um, and it also represents the idea that he's stealthy in sword fighting. And here is that, that's the idea they're talking about again here. When he's talking about the butcher of a silk button, a duelist, he's talking about his great ability to stab um, enemies in a duel. And um, you can see here that Mercutio speaks in prose. Um, many of the characters normally speak in verse. Um, whereas the um, characters sometimes speaking in prose can indicate a difference in status. If they're not speaking in, in verse, it normally indicates that they're of a more lowly status or that they're less intelligent. For instance, the nurse often speaks in prose or, or in blank verse, I suppose, rather than in um, verse, like lots of the other characters do. And that kind of shows her as a comedic character, or also one that's kind of um, unsophisticated, unintelligent. Here, when Mercutio breaks and starts to use this prose, you can see I've written at the bottom there, Mercutio in prose. Um, when Mercutio starts to use prose, it's typically because he's being especially provocative. You know, sometimes he makes lots of those kind of sexual jokes. Sometimes those will be in prose. But we're also talking about provocative in terms of um, provocation of others and that kind of idea of conflict um, that comes through Mercutio's behaviour. And the use of the prose often in increases 
as the feud escalates and as the, the anger begins to simmer, the tensions begin to simmer between the two families. And the prose often shows that Mercutio is becoming steadily more reckless, steadily more um, confrontational, challenging in his behaviour. And um, that the, he's becoming especially provocative in the way that he addresses other people. So we can see here that when he's talking about Tybalt, he's already breaking that verse that he normally speaks in and he's moving more into this prose, that more emotional, confrontational language that he uses. When we go over the page here, we can see this picture of the um, of, of characters fencing um, and, and kind of traditional duelling in, in a kind of sporting sense. When um, Mikusho uses these words, the immortal pasado, the punto reverso, the hay, these three words here are all technical terms for duelling. But the immortal passado, immortal is a reference to mortality, the idea of, of life and death. And it reminds us of that deadly nature of the feud, the idea that things are going to boil over now into real dangerous violence. Benvolio says when Mercutio uses these words, the what? The pox of such antic, lisping, affecting fantasies. These new tuners of accent, by Yezu, a very good blade, a very tall man, a very good whore. Why is not this lamentable thing, grandsire, that we should be thus affected, afflicted by these strange flies, these fashion mongers, these pardon me's, who stand so much on the news, on the new form, that they cannot sit at ease on the old bench? Oh, their bones, their bones. So again, he's kind of making fun of, of the enemy here in the language that he's using, making fun of the, of the, of the family and the fuse. Enter Romeo. Here comes Romeo, here comes Romeo, without his row like a dried herring, O oh, flesh, flesh, how art thou fishified, now is he for the numbers that Petrarch flowed in, Laura to his lady was a kitchen wench, marry she had a better love to rhyme her, Dido a dowry, Cleopatra a gypsy, Helen and Hero, hidelings and harlots, this be a grey eye or so, but not to the purpose. Signor Romeo, bonjour, there's a French salutation to your French slop. You gave us counterfeit fairly last night. So he's teasing Romeo again as a lover. He's comparing Rosaline to all these great and famous lovers and goddesses and kind of um, imitating Romeo's feelings that none of them measure up to this great woman that he has been courting and following. Because of course the men think that Romeo is still in love with Rosaline and they're kind of teasing his love, his lust and his affections. But then here, when he says, you gave us the counterfeit fairly last night, Mercutio is challenging Romeo and saying, basically, you, you blew us off last night. Where did you go? Um, how could you treat us so poorly as your friends and just leave us for a woman? Um, Romeo says, good morrow to you both. What counterfeit did I you? The slip, sir, the slip. Can you not conceive? So you gave us the slip. You ran away. We couldn't find you. Pardon, good Mercutio, my business was great, and in such a case as mine, a man may strain courtesy. Okay, so we're going to stop there, because I've just drawn a line there, because we're just going to flip, a, flip forward a little bit in this act. So we're going to go from page 47 in this act now, to page 50. Okay, in the intervening sections, again, Benvolio continues to tease uh, Romeo about his love for this woman and about the way in which he has abandoned his friends for this woman and again he continues with lots of those kind of innuendos and jokes and and kind of double meanings that we used to Mercutio using because remember he doesn't he, he doesn't really believe in the kind of validity and this kind of um, romanticized version of love he's very much a kind of realist he only aligns love with sex he's very much um, at a surface level when he's talking about love with Romeo and he very much jests with Romeo about the depth of his love and how easily he falls in love with other women. Okay, so in the intervening period, the nurse has then entered to bring a message to Romeo. Um, Mercutio has proceeded to kind of tease and mock the nurse and to kind of include her in his filthy jokes. And so the um, nurse at this stage, we just look halfway down page 50, um, Mercutio and Benvolio have now exited and we now have the nurse um, speaking directly to Romeo and delivering her message. And she says, I pray you, sir, what a saucy merchant was that? It was this that was so full of his ropery? I pray you, sir, what saucy merchant was this that was so full of his ropery? Ropery means like knavishness, rudeness, crudeness, kind of. 
And you can see in this address term, the nurse's direct um, characterization of Mercutio as being quite crude, being foul-mouthed and offensive. And so we can see how somebody of the older generation kind of perceives Mercutio. He is quite a confrontational character. He um, doesn't really have any concerns about offending others. And of course, later on in the text, we actually see that this um, is the cause of um, a kind of further uh, act of violence between the two families in that Mercutio is quite a confrontational character. And so the nurse's direct characterization of him shows this. Romeo says, a gentleman nurse that loves to hear himself talk. So again, Romeo recognises that confrontational attention-seeking part of Mercutio's character. And he will speak more in a minute than he will stand to in a month. And to speak a thing, a thing against, and to speak anything against me, I'll take him down, and I will lustier than he is, and twenty such jacks. And if I cannot, I'll find those that shall, scurvy knave. I am none of his flirt gills. I am none of his skeins, mates. And she turns to Peter, who's another servant who's come with her. And thou must stand by too and suffer every knave to use me at his pleasure. So she's saying to, to Peter, the other servant, I can't believe you just stood around while he made fun of me like that. And she's saying, I will not be made fun of. I am, you know, just as lusty and saucy as he is if he wants to take me on in that game. Peter says, I saw no man use you at his pleasure. If I have, my weapon should quickly have been out. I warrant you. I dare draw as soon as another man, if I see occasion in a good quarrel and the law on my side. The nurse says, now, afore God, I am so vexed that every part of me quivers, scurvy knave. Pray you, sir, a word. And as I told you, my young lady bid me inquire you out. What she bid me say, I will keep to myself. But first, let me tell ye, if ye shall lead her in a fool's paradise, as this, they say, it were a very gross kind of behaviour, as they say. For the gentlewoman is young, and therefore, if you should deal double with her... Truly, it were an ill thing to be offered to any gentlewoman and a very weak dealing. So here, she's warning Romeo. If you look at that line there that's highlighted, and we'll just um, make sure that you can see that a little bit more clearly. In that line there, where she says, if ye should lead her in a fool's paradise, she's using a metaphor there. The fool's paradise shows the folly of love, the foolishness of it, how easily people can be taken in by it. And it reminds us of the fatal flaw of the characters um, the, the ultimate demise of Romeo and Juliet is their love sickness for each other. So it reminds us of that uh, as a fatal flaw, the love sickness of the two characters and how that will eventually lead to their downfall. But notice here as well how the nurse is once again um, delivering these lines with a, with, a, with a large element of kind of maternal love and, and parental guidance here. Remember, she seems to show much more love and affection for Juliet than even Juliet's mother does. Nurse, commend me to thy lady and mistress. I protest unto thee. Good heart, and in faith I will tell her as much. Lord, Lord, she will be a joyful woman. What wilt thou tell her, nurse? Thou dost not mark me. I will tell her, sir, that you do protest, which, as I take it, is a gentleman-like offer. Bid her devise some means to come to shrift this afternoon, and there shall she shall at Friar Lawrence's cell be shrived and married. Here is for thy pains." So if you look at these words here, she will come to shrift. So he's willing her to come to confession. And in Friar Lawrence um, Church, she will be shrived and married. Shrived refers to the, to the confession that you would have to do um, in, in, the, in the Christian church before being married at the time. And so it represents this idea that their love is without sin. And, and there's this kind of sacred nature to their marriage. They're looking to do things properly and religiously and it emphasizes that kind of religious significance of their love the sacred nature of their love and Romeo here is trying to emphasize that true nature of their love so Romeo promises her that she can be uh, married with him that very afternoon um, under the under the guidance of Friar Lawrence and he bids the nurse to go back and deliver this news to Juliet he, he then also tries to pay the nurse for her services. And she says, no, truly, sir, not a penny. Go to, I say you shall. This afternoon, sir, or she shall be there. And again, we're just going to pause here. and um, We're not going to read any further in these final lines of the scene. We're actually going to stop the scene there. So the remaining parts of the scene is some of the final uh, arrangements being made with the nurse. 
none of which is, is hugely significant in terms of analysis. So we know by the end of this scene that Romeo and Juliet are arranged to be married, the arrangements have been made, and they will now marry in secret um, under the guidance of Friar Lawrence. Okay, we'll stop there.